Welcome to Ruck Up Podcast. To help support our guests, check out the show notes below. Also, check us out on all your social media platforms. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, hit us up. On today's episode... It should have been, been me that got that promotion. It should have been me that be in the seat so he could have come back home. So when I did finally get my... My, when I did finally get called up, I went there with the mentality like, fuck it, I'm not going to come back. Like, if somebody has to die out there, I'd rather be. Check out the show else. notes for all the information for our guests and also call us in, let us know your story so you can hear it on the hey, air. Hey, Joel, my name is Akshay Nanavati. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, ultra runner, adventurer, and author of Fearvana. And my journey into Fearvana began many, many years ago when I moved from India to the United States at the age of 13. Soon after moving, I got very heavily into drugs, into alcohol into this world of self-destruction and darkness. I still have these scars on my arm from when I used to cut myself and burn myself and was just on this very self-destructive path. And I actually lost two friends to that lifestyle. But thankfully, I got out when I saw the movie Black Hawk Down. You've seen the movie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> 100 times very over. Movie. Exactly. Yeah. Very powerful I, movie. I, I want to ask you first, you said you when you moved to the States, you fell down a path of de- uh, self-deconstruction. De- what was the meaning behind that was that because of the move and everything that was involved in it or was it a new location new people new friends were you disappointed of not being back in india what what was the issue with that great question so you know when i when i moved i moved from bombay to bangalore to singapore to the us so by the time i was 13 i had already moved to four different cities okay uh, and as a result i was very adaptable but i was also very impressionable so i mean i had great parents couldn't have asked for like awesome life right but when I moved, I got in, and again, I don't blame anybody. I take responsibility for my actions. But when you're a young 13-year-old person with no sense of identity of who you want to be in any sense of, you know, I mean, not a lot of people, I guess some people do, but not a lot of people have that clarity of, of path when they're 13. I certainly did not. And so when I moved, I got into a group of friends that was in, that started drinking and getting into drugs. And I've always been, I've always kind of had this pers- personality to start pushing the edge. So me and one other guy in the group, we were the first two to start going from alcohol and marijuana into harder stuff. Right. He ended up ODing and died, but I was headed down that path. I was, I mean, me, I was the one pushing the line in every way possible right now. Obviously I do it in positive ways, but back then I was just very lost on my path. And so when I got in this group, this was my vehicle of expression was I'm going to be that crazy dude. I'm going to be the extreme guy pushing the line. Now, again, I do it in positive ways, but back then that was my vehicle. And like I was telling my, my folks, I was asked, like, what could we have done differently? And I said, you know, if I had met a group of people who were, let's say, ultra runners or rock climbers, I might have gotten all in into that back then, you know? But again, no regrets, because if I hadn't gone down that path, I wouldn't have joined the Marines. And So is the the acceptance. Exactly. It was to fit in. It was, uh, it was also, I think I, I mean, I would, I haven't put my brain in a scanner, but I would bet there is all kinds of dopamine miswiring <laughs> happening up in my brain. And there's, there's yeah. some studies that show people with addictions tend to have like these dopamine receptors yep. that are a little off. And now if you look at everything I do, it's sort of just channeling that same addictive tendencies into healthier, positive ways. So I think part of it was I had this tendency and that became a very, Thank, again, it could have easily killed me. There was many, many stupid things I did that sometimes I wonder how I made it out. But right. I, it could have easily da- gone down that path. So part of it was it was this combination of nature and nurture. You know, like just being very lost, moving around, and finding uh, a way to get accepted by being the the dude who's doing the craziest, uh, right. uh, like standing out in that way. So luckily, you watched the movie, and that turned your life around. So explain that. That movie was the trigger yeah that planted the seed yeah you know i mean so you've seen the movie watching especially that scene where medal of honor recipients gary gordon and randy sugar they volunteer to go to the ground to set up a defensive perimeter to protect michael durant knowing that thousands of armed enemy personnel are heading their way knowing that they have no idea how long it's going to take before reinforcements will arrive and they ultimately died and they received the medal of honor posthumously but michael durant is alive because of what they did and right. dude, just the courage of that like the what kind of human being would voluntarily put themselves in that harm's way to protect one of their own? And right. so just watching that movie, watching that, and that's one among many other incredible scenes in that movie. And of course, I, it's a true story. So after re- watching that movie, I read the book Black Hawk Down. And then I started devouring book after book after book on military, on life in combat, wars from Korea, Vietnam, World War II, to you know, just devouring it all. And almost overnight, stopped doing drugs and said, this is who I want to be. I want to live in an institution where the good of the group matters more than the good of the individual, where you live for something greater than yourself. Because 
the Marines and the military, they don't give a shit about your well-being. What matters is the good, uh, what matters is the mission and the men. And I wanted yeah. to experience that. I wanted to challenge myself. I, I was living this completely selfish, meaningless, worthless existence, not giving a shit, not only about myself, but what I was doing to my family who loved me and gave me everything, right? And right. Um, and so that was the trigger that transformed my life. But it took me a little while to get in the Marines because I have a blood disorder that two doctors told me would kill me in boot camp. I'm also flat-footed. I have scoliosis. I'm all kinds of fucked up, genetically speaking. So, uh, <laughs> coming from the guy that jumps out of planes and runs marathons, <laughs> I, I know, I know, right? Uh, thankfully, I've worked, learned to work with it. But at the time, it was these were all disqualifying conditions. And honestly, right. if it wasn't a post 9 11 world, I almost certainly would not have gotten it in. But I kind of fought my way into it. It took about a year and a half. And here's a young dumb kid who wants to go Marine Corps infantry, right? So we'll find a we'll find a place for you, kind of thing. It was post, it was this was after 9 11. So. I managed to find my way in and dude, couldn't be more grateful. The Marines was when I started to learn the beauty of suffering, the beauty of pain, the right. beauty of fear, you know, cause I hadn't really suffered, lived a good life before that. And, uh, couldn't, couldn't have asked for a better and, life. You, and know? you had all this pre pre notion that you were going into the Marines as to what you were seeing and reading. You didn't really know what you were getting into. Did you have any friends or anybody, any inspiration or anybody talked to mentorship uh, before you went in or was it just, Fuck it, let's None go. That. Just reading the books, uh, you know, de devouring all of it, reading books on training, reading books on war, and none yeah. of it. And I, dude, I thrived. I don't only like, I mean, one could say that, that you know, you're going in and you, maybe I didn't know what to expect and maybe I would have struggled. But I mean, not only did I obviously survive, but I graduated infantry school as the honor graduate of my platoon. So yeah. I thrived and I loved it. Because when I first went in, I was originally going to go into career. I wanted to go special ops as well, but I wasn't a U.S. citizen when I enlisted. So oh, okay. I couldn't I couldn't go into special ops because they required secret clearance. So I thought, you know, I'll go in, go infantry, go once I get my citizenship later on, I can go into uh, special ops. Obviously that right. trajectory changed, but that was initially the plan. Right. So once you're in the Marines, uh, what did you what was your first initial reaction when you started? I mean, after like, after coming out of boot camp and SOI, I was volunteering to go to Iraq or Afghanistan every chance I could. I yeah. wanted to go I mean, I, so I don't mean to sound like a war junkie or whatever, but one of the w war is this experience that reveals the essence of the human condition at its most extreme. So you oh see people doing awful things. Yeah. You, you, I mean, you can relate, right? It, you see human beings do awful things to each other, obviously in war, you see that, but you also see people sacrificing their lives for each other. Absolutely. And so it brings out the very edges of the human condition. And it's of course, not just war, but pushing into these extreme scenarios, allows you to experience humanity at a far more intense level than you can anywhere else. So when I went in, I wanted to go to war. I wanted to go experience those edges. I wanted to see what that would reveal, not just in me, but about the human condition, about the essence of what we are. But for somebody like yourself, you're looking a lot more at the psychological reasons for everything around that's happening around you, not just, like you said, just the war aspect. You, you're You're digging in deep into the personal nature of everybody and everything not, not as much i mean I, I didn't have a level of awareness and conscious sort of growth that i do now so i wouldn't say it was as conscious but looking back for sure that was definitely a part of it you know i also like i mean i wanted to serve where like i mean so there's a there was a buddy of mine that we were in the same unit we were volunteering to go every chance we could and so i wanted to experience the edge of these like experience the edge of humanity at that condition and to serve something greater than myself, like separate from all the politics of the war, you know, right. actually it was a history major. So I wrote my history thesis on it. Yeah. It shouldn't gone in this and the other thing, but separate from all the politics of the war on the ground, we were doing something noble. We were doing something good. There was a mission. There was a meaning and we, and serving where again, you, you live for the man next to you, right? Your men right. and your mission, that's everything. And there is something incredibly beautiful and profound about living in a world like that. And so the Marines, like when I first joined, it was the taste, but I wanted the full, I wanted the full flavor of that life. Right. And the, right. the only way to do it, you don't join Marine Corps infantry. I mean, ideally you don't, uh, unless you weren't necessarily thinking, but you don't join Marine Corps <laughs> infantry without the intention to go to war. Right. While right. you Absolutely. Join. Yeah. But no, I, I, sorry, go ahead. No, I agree hundred um, percent. I, I wanted to kind of kick back to the blood disorder. Can you explain what that was and how that affected sure. you? It's, so it's called thalassemia, and basically, like, so the way it works is a normal guy has about 14 to 16 grams of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin transports oxygen through the blood. I have about 11. 
so there's a less oxygen flowing through my blood. That's not right. ideal for anybody, let alone an athlete, right? And yeah. so, and so the two hematologists that I went to, they said that boot camp would kill me. So I went to a third one. He gave me the letter of approval. I took that to the Marines. They then it took me about a year and a half to get in because I had to get the waivers because it's a disqualifying okay. condition. Yeah, so yeah. I had to get medical waivers to like sort of you know to get get over that uh, uh, that condition. And finally, and I was flat footed. And I had scoliosis. So I had to sort of get you know all of that. <laughs> uh, so how did you overcome that to to obviously graduate or even pass? You know, when I when I first before joining the Marines, so I'd also just gotten out of that world of drugs. So it's not like I was in great shape or anything like that, right? Yeah, that wasn't I, helping your chances. <laughs> no, it certainly wasn't. <laughs> I mean, when I went to boot camp, I was not in top notch shape. I survived right. mentally, but I was not very, very fit by any measure. Uh and I you know, so I viewed it as an obstacle. Like I always thought like oh, I'm never gonna be able to be that fit until I started pushing myself and this and sort of the lesson is it's like the greatest lessons are in the doing. So I had it as a sort of a fixed mindset because I have this, you know, I'll, I'll be fine in boot camp because obviously at this point I knew this was my path. So nothing, nobody was going to stop me. I don't give a shit right. how many doctors told me that I couldn't go in. I was going to find my way into there, right? Right. And so I knew that that was my path. But I also believed I wouldn't necessarily, like some part of me believed I wouldn't necessarily be able to get that fit because of this until I started getting fitter and getting fitter and getting fitter. And now it's like, it's just a beautiful opportunity, man. Every new, every new struggle, every new adversity is another opportunity to transcend that adversity. And right. in that transcendence, there is growth in that transcendence. There is an awakening. So now it's like, now I'm an ultra runner doing crazy shit, running 24 hours, polar expeditions, climbing mountains. I mean, I've climbed mountains in the Himalayas where I've had severe altitude sickness, like horrible headaches less yeah. oxygen flow through your blood in high altitude is not ideal right <laughs> but it's uh it's uh now it's just to me all of it is just another opportunity to transcend you're fucking that's crazy thing. that's all you're gonna say <laughs> that, that, that's that's insane though that that's that's so that's very inspirational that you can actually do that like i'm sure there's a lot of people that would tap out halfway up that mountain i can guarantee you that let alone have the the disability that you have the blood disability and and making it that far that's that's very impressive congratulations on that thank you um now during your tours how did everything affect you how were you able to get through each mission that you did and then finally coming home from each of them so after after coming out of my unit i didn't get deployed although i was volunteering every chance i could get uh, twice the marines told me i was going and then last minute they canceled it so i didn't actually finally get my opportunity till three years later in 2007 i was deployed and Kind of, I guess, to backtrack, you know, I touched on that. I, when I joined the unit, there was a buddy of mine, and me and him were volunteering to go every chance we could. So me and him, like twice, they told us we're going. Last minute, they canceled it. And one summer, I had come to vacation here in India and uh, to meet my family and whatnot here. And while I was here, he ended up finding a unit to go with. And he got deployed, and he was hit with an IED, and he was killed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. So, you know, thank you. So when I finally got my chance to go i went with like it tore me up i i it tore me up that i wasn't there with him it tore me up that i had gone on that one vacation and i didn't go with them because we had been trying like to go together we became like extremely right. close and even you know when we trained together i would like beat him by a few points on the rifle range or beat him by a few seconds on a run so i'd always beat him like on the little things we used to always of course have that friendly competition and so what happened was when he got deployed he was a good marine so he got promoted to corporal and as a result he was hitting that seat and he got killed with an ied right so I always thought that it should have been me that went. It should have been me that got that promotion. It should have been me that be in his seat so he could have come back home. So when I did finally get my, my – when I did finally get called up, I went there with the mentality like, fuck it. I'm not going to come back. Like if somebody has to die out there, I'd rather be me than anybody else. And this was not – I'm not trying to say like no, nothing heroic. I'm not saying it was a healthy way to approach it. But that, that's kind of how I went. So I gave away a lot of my shit. I was like, I'm fucking right. ready to go, you know. Um, yep. And so it wasn't the healthiest mindset because I honestly did not have a – a fear of death and i think that's not not I don't, that's not a good thing <laughs> a fear of death i think yeah. is a good thing like today i'm terrified of dying back then i did right. not so i went out there you know and um ultimately came, obviously i came back home but I, it was an infantry non-commissioned officer i was a corporal by the time i got out there i had one of those jobs like one of those jobs where every time we hit a danger zone like a bridge or anything i would walk in front of our vehicle convoys looking for ieds before they could be used to kill us and to kill kill you know to, to blow up our vehicles yeah. So obviously it was a somewhat dangerous job because me and the two, me and the other guy who are clearing the bridge, if somebody's going to get hit first with that <laughs> IUD, right? Guess yeah, who? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, but at this point already, I had developed a strong comfort with fear and with risk because 
again, to preface before I even got deployed at this point, like after joining the Marines, like I now started looking for other ways to test myself because the Marines planted that seed, right? I, I, I just got a taste of fear and struggle. Now I wanted to go all out. So I started mountain climbing, cave diving, skydiving, rock climbing, like the nature between my time, nature became my playground to explore my fears, every fear from heights to tight spaces to open, like open water. I was terrified of all these things like terrified. So I started exploring every single one. So by the time I got to Iraq, I had a very high degree of tolerance for risk and fear that I was like, I mean, I had many times we were out on missions and I remember like we debrief and some people in the squad thought that, you know, like felt the threat of life. I did not, you know, because I was just so had a, such a high tolerance. I mean, I used to rock climb uh, like walls without rope, you know, the level of risk in that is insanely high. One mistake and you fall. Absolutely. So I used to, so I had, this was before going to Iraq. I used to climb like 60, 70, 80 foot rock walls without rope. So I had developed a very strong comfort zone with fear and risk and went out there and, uh, you know, struggled. The thing I struggled most with in war in, in Iraq was it wasn't, I went closer to the end of the war. So we, yes, we had pop shots going off. We had like a rocket hit our base or, or like right across the town in our base. Yeah. We had shot pop shots going off here and there, but it wasn't what I wanted in the experience of war. If, right. And again, I know it sounds super like I'm a war junkie and all that, but that's just the yep. reality of where I was. You I know, get it. And so I was pissed off. So when I came back home, I was pissed off. I felt like I hadn't, I didn't get shot. I didn't get lose a limb. I didn't fucking die. Why do I get to come back home? I felt like I hadn't suffered enough to earn my place on this planet. Right. So I wanted to go back. I kept trying to say, go back again. Like, dude, send me to Iraq, Afghanistan, send me somewhere. Just, I want to go back to war. I have not done enough to yeah. earn this, earn this place to come back home. And, uh, you know, I'd never end up getting the chance. So actually what I did when I came back, I finished my undergrad and I volunteered to go. I mean, I, I went and got my master's in journalism because I wanted to go back to war as a combat journalist. So I was seeking every chance I could go to go back onto the edges um, after I came back home. But then I happened to meet my, now we're no longer mad, but met my wife at the time in journalism school. And so that path once again changed. Uh, I'm, I'm very surprised that you didn't go into the contracting world after that. You know, I... I had like, I wasn't sure what to do after the Marines. So I wasn't sure where to go, what to do. I had no, no clarity. I certainly didn't know I'd end up where I was now. At one point I thought I'd be a mountain bum. Cause I was like, fuck, I'm going to go to the Himalayas and just climb. <laughs> you know, I get to go experience the edge and life right. and death in a different context. Yeah. So that was one, but war journalism ap appealed to me because see like in the military a while, again, I love it. One of the Marines, one of the proudest things in my life, treasure that experience, but there's zero freedom. Like we always yeah. say, you, you, we, we preserve democracy. We don't practice it. So <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of bullshit you deal with in the military, right? Yeah, and yeah, so I, yeah. after that, I was like, you know what? Fuck this. Like, I, I'm tired of putting my sort of, I mean, we had just do just out there, like officer tells you to do some shit. You got to go do it. No questions asked. And I was like, I'm done with this, man. I'm done yeah. with all that nonsense. So that's why so, I joined the contracting world. <laughs> no doubt. I right? did, didn't like that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so that's why I didn't think about the contract. I just thought like journalism will allow me to also to do some good because, right. you know, like again, there's obviously, one can say good wars, like the World War II is the noble war, right? And then shouldn't have gone to this war and, and the nobility of war in and of itself. But there are times when it needs to be fought. And I felt like through journalism, I could use, I could get what I was seeking from war and, and hopefully do some good as well to tell these right. stories that could leave a mark and make, make a, you know, make a difference. That Absolutely. was originally the plan. So what happened after that? So, you know, when I met my wife uh, at the time, uh, that changed. Being a combat journalist is not really conducive to a good family life. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so I ended up getting a corporate job for a year and a half after finishing my master's. Now, at this point, got out of the Marines. Again, at one point, I wanted to go career. But after all that, like, I was like, all right, you know, I think I've done my time. I'm good. Let me move on and figure out what's next. So I got a corporate job just to be like, no not a total degenerate mountain bum or something, put some food on the table kind of thing, be, right. be a responsible adult. But, um, yeah. but the fun thing is the day I signed up for the corporate job, I also signed up to go ski across Greenland for a month. So I, was, I signed up to do an expedition where I was going to drag a 190 pound sled for 350 miles across the second largest ice cap in the world for one month. And it was a year and a half later. So I gave myself a year and a half to basically figure out what the hell I'm going to do and build a business around this and, uh, and then go off to ski across Greenland. So quit my job, went and skied across the ice cap, and came back and started building the business. But the thing what I did not know at the time is I was still seeking, like going on the ice cap was another version of seeking the edge, right? I was just running away from all that shit I did not want to confront. I just wanted to go back into a hostile world where life and death was on the line. 
There's right. a simplicity of like like going yeah. on these expeditions, polar expeditions, mountaineering, and there's many elements of it that replicate the essence of what the addictive nature of what war is, you know, right. without like the sort of horrors of war in many ways. So there was a lot of similarities in what the edges I was seeking. But when I came back from that, now without any structure, without the stru structure of a corporate job, without the structure of an expedition life where you have to abide by a structure to accomplish a mission and even to stay alive, now the demons started to rise up. So now I started like slowly drinking more. I mean, I was kind of growing my business. So it wasn't like still building a successful business, still training, like running marathons. But, you know, first I'm drinking on a Saturday, then a Friday and Saturday. Slowly but surely, that leads to three days, four days. Next thing you know, is getting to points where I'd be going on these like five day binges. Man, I got to a point in my life that I would drink a bottle of vodka a day. Like just mm -hmm. drink till I pass out and wake up and keep drinking and just go on and on and on like for five, six days until my body couldn't take it. Yeah. And eventually this shit started to get real, real bad till the one, like I would go through these binges, sober up. And one morning after like a five day binge session, I thought this sort of pattern of sobering up and drinking is never going to change. And I was like seconds away from picking up a knife and slitting my own wrist. Yeah. That was like the rock bottom that, I mean, it wasn't, that wasn't the aha that magically changed everything and everything got smooth after that, but it was the trigger that started my slow, but sure climb out of that darkness, out of that abyss. If you could take two points that were, that you felt that was causing your depression, what would they be? Not confronting those things I was avoiding and not being willing to be with the pain. So what happened and how, how it started even going down this path. So uh, to be very frank, what was going on was, you know, I was having at this point, like, as, as I, as this was, I think, a few years after I came back from Greenland and the job and all that, I was having issues physically with my wife at the time. And it wasn't a physical issue, it was a psychological one, right? But she was right. like, hey, let's go find out, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go find out what's going on. So I went to the VA, went to the therapist, and that's when it started, like, this stuff started coming out a little bit more. And in that, you know, I, I still felt guilty. I still felt guilty like I haven't done enough. Dude, I still fucking feel it <laughs> to this day. It's not like it's yeah. entirely gone away. I've just learned to work with it in a much healthier way, obviously. But I felt guilty and I wasn't confronting that shit. I yeah. didn't feel like I struggled with life in the normal world. I still wanted to go to the edge. And to this day, I, temp I have to temper my desire to go back into conflict zones, you know? So I was seeking that. I was seeking, I was unfulfilled with the mundane. I wanted to be on the edge. Uh, I wanted, I felt like I hadn't done enough to earn my place in the life. I felt like I hadn't done enough in the war. I mean, I knew guys who would, who like a, a friend of mine ran into a burning Humvee to save a fellow Marine, you know? And I was like, I didn't do fucking shit. Like what, what right do I have to? And I just hadn't confronted us. So like when I was doing Greenland, when I had the corporate job, there was structure provided. So in the sense that structure kept me from having to confront that stuff, right. you know what I mean? And yeah. so without it, the drinking was the easy escape, right? Like, and dude, I would have moments where I would drink and then watch war movies and just fucking tear up, like tear yeah. up crime. Like, I mean, I still remember when that show, The Pacific came out on HBO. Right. Uh, I was in grad school and I, I knew it would fucking tear me up, but it was the Pacific, like Marines Pacific. I had to watch it. My unit served in Iwo Jima. And every fucking time I would watch it and get ha shit face drunk and, uh, and tear, tear up crying that every night that, that I would watch that show. And so the, the demons just started to rise up and I had never really gone into those spaces to deal with that. And how do you deal with it? You know, so when I hit that rock bottom, I started delving deeper into research because something wasn't working in the therapist. Like now, like they were great people. They were genuinely good people. They wanted to help. I loved, like in my experience with the VA for whatever people say about it, it's been nothing but fantastic. They're awesome people. But in now everything I've learned from going deep into neuroscience, psychology, spirituality is that they were just operating from a really bad playbook in terms of how to navigate the Sorry. struggle. Yeah. 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 No, and so, and, I agree. And so, yeah, I mean, you like we see this. Well, it's, it's just it's just weird because like if I like I I've been asked or or not, yeah I guess I've been asked to go see help at some points in my in my life, and every time I've gone to see help from a psychologist or anybody, they're literally fucking reading from a book, and I'm like I'm not a book. I I have very different feelings and emotions to the last person that sat down in this chair, and quite frankly, you're not helping me. You're just making me mad, and it would happen every single time. I'm not saying that psychologists or anybody else can't figure me out because I'm sure there are out there. However, I just don't appreciate being treated like, well, you have A, B, and C, and that's just how it is. Well, I don't have A, B, and C. I probably have D, E, and F, but I guess I'm like everybody else, so I'll just fall under those categories. And that's what always made me mad. So I found ways yeah. to, like you're talking about, I use the word demons all the time too, but the word, I, I, I found other ways of dealing with my demons. I don't drink. I don't 
I don't use sugars. Sugars made me fucking whack. So I don't drink energy drinks. And there was just those small things that led to the bigger things like using my own time. You like to go out and do runs. I like to go hunting. Like it was just taking your own time away from the, the, the day-to-day activities that you do to reset your brain. And that's, that's personally what's worked for me, but I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to interrupt you, but that's just, I I hear where you're saying from the point of view of the, the physicians and the, and at all them telling you, this is how it's going to be. And you're just like, but that's not, it's not me. Like, I understand where you're coming from. Maybe other people are like that, but that's not how I feel. Yeah. No, I feel you, man. I can totally relate in my own experience. And I have so many stories from other people I've heard who gone at therapy and again i'm not knocking all of them uh just like you're not but they're just these bad stories of how they like one one therapist told one of my veteran buddies that when a cucumber becomes a pickle it can never go back to being cucumber you're like that pickle now like what the fuck are you telling him like he's fucked for life now in the head because of that oh like, that's exactly you, you have, what yeah like, and then like that's absurd you know like, yeah. a really good a really good example of this is so dr martin seligman he's one of the leading researchers of positive psychology movement he went into west point and he asked the cadets there how many of you have heard the word post-traumatic stress disorder? And it was something like 90, 95% raised their hand. Yeah. And then he asked them, how many of you have heard of post-traumatic growth? And it was less than 5%. Right. And the whole point he was making, we have created a self-fulfilling prophecy that people associate, if I go to war, if I experience trauma, I will inevitably have disorder. And that's Absolutely. become, and we're not, so I'm not like consciously choosing it, but it's become a belief system, a paradigm that we fall into that that's yeah. just what's going to happen. Like when I came back, I was jumpy with loud noises. I struggled with crowds. I struggle with survivor's guilt. Now, these were all things that they told me were symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, but they're not. They're symptoms of post-traumatic stress, but they're a very normal human response to war. Like my brain learned to say loud noises equals death for seven months, so you better be hypervigilant. You better be aware. That's a survival mechanism. It's not a disorder. It's a normal human response to war. But by attaching the word disorder onto it, we start cultivating that into our self-identity, and that was the problem. I agree 100%. I mean, I, I don't like large, large crowds, not because of work, because I hate people. So it just it, it works for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, don't have to, I don't have to be around large crowds. But uh, no, it's exactly right. And I know a lot of people who have been, like you said, they're, they've almost been programmed to think that this is the end game for them. This is how yeah. they're supposed to be, you know, take some pills, you know, go to go to treatment every so often. And that's just it. And it's unfortunate because now we're learning a lot more about PTSD than we did 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. However, like you said, it's now becoming this condescending term where that's it. That's the end of the road for you. And there's no, there's no passing, going, collecting $200. So. Exactly. And I mean, like even in the U S man, when people sometimes hear I'm a veteran and I get that it's coming from this place of love, but there's always this sense of like pity, like, Oh, poor you, you're probably all kinds of fucked up in the head. You know what I mean? And, and there's this, and again, I get where people it's coming from like a, a good place, but that's just the paradigm that's been set. If you go to war, you have PTSD. And that becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy. And so as I started learning, I started shifting that. Like, no, man, I don't abide by this. I don't have a disorder. Right. I have these normal – like, guilt is not something fucked up. Like, it's not nothing – it's not a bad emotion. There's nothing wrong with it. Guilt was an expression of love. And, like, rationally, I get it, man. Everybody told me. And I, I get it. I could have gone to war with my buddy. He could have still died. I could have still come back alive. Nobody can control what happens in war. Bullets fly where they fly. Bombs, like, you can't control that shit, right? So rationally, I get it. But emotionally, it doesn't change the fact that obviously I felt guilty. And I'm not obviously – tons of veterans go through this. Not just veterans. A lot of people who lose somebody, they, they sort of ask that question yeah. sometimes. Why them, not me? So what okay. is that? But my, so, question yeah, is, my question is, is why are you not allowed to feel that way? Exactly. Like that, that, that's the problem is everybody's like, well, no. Yeah, you could have gone to war and you could have died. And it is what it is. But no, I feel this way. And guess what? I'm allowed to have fucking emotions. So if you don't like it, fucking kick rocks. Like, exactly. It's just how we work on those emotions so that we can struggle. We don't struggle. We we are we're able to go day to day rather than having the emotion of the guilt. And then also having the 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 feeling of, well, I can't even feel this way because I'm supposed to put on this happy face all the time. Yeah. Yeah, everybody said, don't feel guilty, it's not your fault. Like, we always do that as a society. We say, don't feel anxious, don't be scared, don't stress out. We're always saying, don't feel what you feel. The reality is, feel whatever the fuck you feel, feel it. Like, there's no bad emotions. There's there's just emotions. It's what you do with it that matters. So, when like, what what I eventually did was, I actually put, when I started learning all this stuff and practicing it, I put a picture of my friend that I lost in the war up on my wall. And it said under it, this should have been you. Earn this life. Right. 
Like that's an intense fucking thing to look at, but my guilt became my fuel. My guilt became my ally to write my book, to do meaningful work in this world, you know? So it wasn't bad, it just was. And what I do with it was up to me. And so to your yeah. point, it's, we got, we all, it's okay to feel what you feel. Now, I don't want to gloss over your book, so let's talk about your book. Um, let's talk about why you wrote it. Well, you kind of did, but let's let's hit it a little bit harder, and let's talk about what it is, name of the title, and everything else. So the book is called Fear Vana, The Revolutionary Science of How to Turn Fear into Health, Wealth, and Happiness. And the idea of the concept is fear and nirvana, right? There are these two seemingly contradictory ideas, that fear is the antithesis of nirvana. Nirvana is bliss, enlightenment, and fear is this most demonized emotion, right? The most primal emotion, the single greatest barrier that stops us. And everybody frames fear as something bad, and the nirvana is the opposite, right? So what the ethos and the idea of fear vana is that they not only can coexist, but they must coexist. And that fear is an access point to bliss, an access point to enlightenment itself. So the whole ethos and why I wrote it was the, like the fundamental concept at the highest level is to help people develop a positive relationship to any kind of suffering, to fear, right. to stress, to anxiety, to pain, to struggle, to adversity, to suffering to develop a positive relationship and to stop demonizing it. Like I wrote the book because I was going through all these things and learning like no bad and good emotions. These are not bad. Like, it you know, shifting my own relationship to my own post-traumatic stress. And I realized that like everybody demonizes. We say fear is bad. Anxiety is bad. We attach words like disorder to it. We live in a world that says, how do we eliminate stress? People say, don't be scared, be fearless. And I was like, this is all nonsense. And this is the single greatest problem in the way of our collective well-being because if you think about it, like if we can, as I like to say that my mantra is to suffer well, if we can suffer well, if we can smile in the face of suffering, then inevitably we can live a more blissful, fulfilling, peaceful life because it won't right. matter whether life punches us in the face or whether we're pursuing a worthy challenge, like writing a book, building a business, running a marathon, anything worthwhile is going to be hard. But if you can fall in love with the suffering and the process, life becomes more meaningful no matter what. And so I wrote the book to help people transcend these negative relationships, these negative associations with fear, with stress, with anxiety, with pain, and have helped them fall in love with it. It's obviously uncomfortable. Like it's obviously going to be horribly uncomfortable embracing suffering, but that's the key. Like you do that life in and of itself just becomes the journey becomes more peaceful, more meaningful, more blissful, all of it. And that's why I wrote the book to help. I mean, obviously I was not the only person who suffered. Everybody suffers in their own way. And I wanted to share the things I was learning because it was also very counterintuitive to conventional approach and all these things. And I wanted to like get people out of the other gar the what I perceived to be as garbage and the destructive ideas around all these things and help them see another path, a path right. that could lead them to a more meaningful life. And did you think of this 80 feet up with no ropes on the side of the mountain? <laughs> no, I did. I did not. I actually didn't come up with the word. My uh, my ex-wife Kate coined the word. I was living this lifestyle. You know, I was doing all these things and she crystallized it, gave it the name. And when she did, I was like, that is brilliant. Like right. bah, 20 different domain names of fear of honor. I was like, that shit's gold. Like that's it. Uh, yeah, when, I, you, I, when, you, when you Google it, you're the only thing that comes up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we and, and part of the reason also is because when we were talking about it, I mean, her, like, like is the idea is that we needed to create a new word. We needed to create a new, like, because fear, no matter how many times I could say to somebody, fear is good, fear is like great, embrace it. The, the relationship we have to it is still etched into our subconscious, right? right? Negatively. So we were like, we need to create a new word that gives people literally creating a new emotional state. Because words can define our emotions. Words can shape our experience. So when you create a new one, you're giving the people the opportunity to create a new experience to life. Absolutely. And so that's why we, had, we wanted to create something that did not exist to, to build something new that people could embrace on their journey. A lot of people that work in first responders in the military, they use fear as, um, as, as not a negative term. In most cases, it, it's to, to help them push through, um, to mm -hmm. help them understand what the, and also too, is if you, if you're experiencing fear, you're also going to experience a lot more, um, I guess, plans on how not to die in a situation. So that fear is actually helping you to survive. Absolutely. One of my mantras is that fear propels you to prepare. So when you engage the fear, you understand it, you can train for it, you can prepare for it. Like everything I do from beginning to war to skiing across ice caps to climbing mountains, all these things are absolutely terrifying. Writing a book was terrifying. Writing a book on fear was terrifying. Yeah, you know what crazy. I mean? So <laughs> I, I honestly, I, honestly, as soon as I read ice climbing, that was pretty much the cap of it. I was like, nope, done. <laughs> <laughs> 
Nice but, climbing. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. And, and you can do that, but I will not. <laughs> uh, I do want to talk about some people that have been involved in your book too. And that's uh, actually, I don't even want to name. I want you to name the two people who helped you along the way with that too. Like uh, in terms of. Dalai writing. Lama. Yeah. So yeah, I was very blessed that the Dalai Lama wrote the forward for the book. Uh, I was truly honored. And I was blessed with many great endorsements from people like Jack Canfield, Seth Godin, Marshall Goldsmith, uh, Keith Ferrazzi, you know, Marcy yeah. Shimoff, many amazing, uh, amazing people. I was very grateful that they uh, endorsed the book. And obviously the Dalai Lama was one off just personally and spiritually very fulfilling and just a huge honor. But in terms of marketing the book for an unknown author with no brand, game changer, man. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> yeah. I, I, was that like, uh, did you did you meet him in a, a washroom somewhere? No, like, it, was, <laughs> how'd you that it, up? Was, it was a pure, pure cold pitch. Uh, yeah. I just uh, you know, so funny thing about that, like when I when I first okay, I had this book now, I had this concept, Fear Vaughn, this book. It's a very spiritual concept. So I thought, yeah. okay, who's this sort of spiritual leader in the world that could validate this concept, give it that social proof? Obviously, Dalai Lama's name popped up, right? But then first when it popped up, I was like, there's no way. Who am I? All that good stuff that we go through, right? The doubt, the who am I stuff, the fear, all that good stuff. I was like, there's no way it could happen. And then a little later on, I was like, you know, why not try? What's the worst that could happen? He, the worst case scenario is he says no, and I'm exactly in the same position I would be anyway. Right. So why not try? <laughs> Yeah. So I reached out to like, I did a bunch of research. I found one name and an email address in the office of Fizzoliness. Uh, yeah. First, I tried reaching out from the website, kind of got me nowhere. So found this name, found this email address, shot a personal video, sharing my story, sharing what I've gone through, sharing the vision for Fear of Honor. 100% of the profits of the book go to charity as well. So everything we're trying to do with the book, this particular monk connected with me, like three other monks, built now connected to the right person. And so over five months, I was building a relationship with this monk. And this is the key point I also want to stress and why this, I think, his story is valuable is that, you know, so when I was reaching out to him the whole time, like I would send an email, knock an email back for two, three weeks, right? And in my mind, I'm like, oh, they hate my book, feeling with doubt. There's no right. way they're going to do it. All the good stuff. But the thing is, you can have those doubts, you can have those fears, but you don't have to let them define your actions. And right. this is really like important because we often say, don't feel doubt when you feel, like, just be confident. It's okay what you feel, but you're not your thoughts, you're not your emotions. You're the thinker of your thoughts and the feeler of your feelings. So you can have an emotion, but not be defined by that emotion. So I would follow up anyway, follow up anyway, build a relationship. And after about five, six months of building relationships with Monk there, he wrote me and he said, considering everything you've been through and your genuine desire to serve, I'll press your case. And I was wow. truly grateful. Like I ended up getting like, not just, I originally only asked for like a one line endorsement, but the Dalai Lama wrote the forward for the book and they sent me like this letter and the seal and a signature. We have it framed in the house. It was just, I, yeah. it was just a huge honor. It was a that, tremendous honor. <laughs> that is tremendous. That's awesome. Um, so what is your next plan in life? Uh, right now, the goal is I'm training for many big polar expeditions. Uh, for the next couple of years, polar expeditions are going to be my main avenue of uh, outdoor adventure pursuits. So that yeah. means like skiing to the North Pole, skiing to the South Pole. Uh, I have a series. I'm doing, like I'm supposed to go to the North Pole right now in March, crossing my fingers. It goes down because of all this travel stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, so I have many adventures lined up. And then uh, in addition to training and funding all these crazy adventures, I have the Fearvana empire that I am building. So the vision for Fearvana is to build a series of products and services in different verticals to help people build a positive relationship with suffering so they can do three things. Find, live, and love their worthy struggle. I call it your worthy struggle, like your path in life, whatever that path is. I call yeah. it the worthy struggle because it will be hard. So I don't like to use the term follow your passion. Not that passion is bad, but like, it conveys this idea that if you just follow your passion, life will be sunshine and rainbows. Right. And, well, it's going to be hard, but that's not a bad thing, right? So the idea yeah. is to find, live, and love your worthy struggle. So building the Fearvana empire, the vision is to create like Fearvana fitness, Fearvana festivals, Fearvana retreats. I have my own nonprofit called the Fearvana Foundation. We're launching a Fearvana super fuel, so Fearvana supplement line, a Fearvana clothing line, uh, like a whole ecosystem, Fearvana journeys, Fearvana adventures, creating this ecosystem around this concept that will ultimately help people live a more – it, that improve the content of our human experience. Right. That's the right. long-term vision for what I'm building. And okay. So you're going to go on another, or you're planning on going on another expedition. Um, Many. What, yes, sir. Okay. So what, what does the expedition entail? How, how does it work? Tell so us right, what happens. right now I'm trained, uh, the, I'm training for the next immediate ones will be 10 days in Northern Norway and Svalbard. So polar expedition is you drag a sled with yeah. all your food and supplies to survive out in these like incredibly cold, hostile environments. Like that dude uh, that an did Antarctica or something for like 90 days or 60 days or something. I can't remember. But. Well, 
I think I know what you're talking about, but that dude was full of shit. He didn't actually ski across Antarctica. He just said he did, but he actually did oh. not. And oh. that was just pure shit. Yeah, he, I know. He got crazy famous, but it's pure bullshit. He Fair did enough. not ski across Antarctica. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Is that the same kind of principle same where idea. you have a, exactly. a huge sled full of your gear and you got to exactly. trek it wherever? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I am doing a 42 day expedition to the South Pole. Uh, Later this year, idea again. Ideally, I'm not sure how things will pan out. And then I have a series of other bigger ones planned in Antarctica. Uh, some like bunch of different stuff planned over the next two years. So that, how do you set are, something like that up? Like obviously, not just anybody can go there. So you have to go through the proper channels. And what would be the proper channels? Some so there are companies that organize like tri organize these trips. Okay. And so in, initially, you know, I'm doing a sort of guided trip. Like you're still dragging your own sled and stuff like that. But going with the guide, so I learned the, I mean, I've done it in Greenland, but Greenland was a long time ago. So I want to get my skills back up. And then eventually I want to do some stuff on my own in Antarctica and the Arctic and stuff like that. More uh, bigger expeditions that I have lined up that are in the back of my mind. But initially going with some of my friends who organize these, lo organize logistics for these expeditions. So I can get the technical skills down, build my experience, build the, because like physical training, you know, I, I train like a beast. I run a lot. I hit the gym. I drag tires, which is a fucking nightmare. I hate doing yeah, that yeah, shit. Yeah. But yeah. The tire simulates the sled, so it's but, necessary. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but you know, um, in addition to that, the technical skills is what I really want to improve of surviving and uh, navigating life in the cold and, and knowing how to do that. So if you could give somebody one bit of advice on how to harness their fears, um, what would that advice be? The, the one, like most important thing, the mindset thing is to not perceive it as something bad. It's not the enemy. Don't judge your fear when it shows up. Like I'll give you an example. I worked with this guy who said, I'm just waiting for the fear to go away so I can quit my job and start my business. I said, that's right. your problem. You're waiting for the fear to go away because we think fear is bad. People tell us we should be, would be fearless. Don't be scared of failure. How many times do we hear that? Don't be scared of failure. Like, fuck yeah. it. Be scared of failure. I'm terrified of failing. But use that fear. So once you have that, once you stop demonizing fear and don't judge it as bad and just be with it, Next step, what do you do with it? So like I said earlier, fear propels you to prepare. So what do you do with that fear? Why am I scared? What am I scared of? What's the worst case scenario? How do I prepare for the worst case scenario? Like write that shit down. I did that for my book. What am I scared of? People would hate the book. But like because I was scared of writing a bad book, I wrote yeah. a book worthy of being endorsed by the Dalai Lama. And I'm like, and I'm saying this, yes, with some degree of ego in the sense that I'm damn proud of it now, but it's because I was terrified of writing a shitty book. I mean, I must have trashed like 100,000 words worth of work. No exaggeration. That's months worth of work. But I was so scared of writing a shitty book, so I studied from great authors like Jack Canfield. I said, okay, how do you write a good book? You know, So use the fear. Engage the fear. Have clarity on what is waiting for you on the other side of that fear. Like right. what's like everything, like any path you pursue in life, there's any crossroads, there's going to be a struggle no matter which path you choose. So if you're going to choose this path, it's okay to be scared. What are you scared of? Engage it. Use it. What's the reward on the other side of it? Like what helped me finally finish writing my book right. was – the fear of also like embrace the fear of consequences. Like what if you don't take this action? What if you die never having done this thing, writing my book, skiing across like that shit is terrifying. Like that's, as I said earlier today, I'm terrified of dying, man. I wasn't earlier, but today it's death scares the shit out of me. And I fucking love it. I use that shit. I yeah, embrace it. Yeah, I hold on to absolutely. it. So yeah, have clarity on what's waiting for you. You can visualize, get in that mindset, talking to yourself, building that inner voice, like, cultivating that shit and really being specifically clear on what's waiting for you. I can't stress the importance of clarity as well, because now you have something to channel that fear into. It's not just like wandering aimlessly, right? You need something to channel that fear into. So it, it gives it purpose. It gives it clarity. What do you channel your fear into? The expeditions and the building the business. So those are my two main focuses uh, right now is, uh, uh, is, getting like these different expeditions because after the after this i mean i have, I have expedi dude, I have a lifetime's worth of expeditions i don't think one lifetime will cover the entire bucket list that i have planned and it terrifies me dude i don't know how to build a business to the level that i want to build it like build right. this massive global empire i have no fucking clue how to do all of that so it yeah. terrifies me that i'll fail it terrifies me that it'll go to shit it terrifies me that i don't know what i'm doing i'm terrified of dying on my expeditions i'm terrified of uh, uh dying too early before the mission is fulfilled i'm terrified of the pain I see in the world and my, I, I will die without having helped as many people as I could help. That's one of the reasons why, how I temper my desire to go back into conflict zones now, because if I go back into a war zone to let's say help the one or two people in a war zone, I could get, I could die. And then every, like, if I had done that before writing Fearvana, every person's life who's been touched by Fearvana now would not have had that benefit. So I try to hold on to my fear of the greater mission 
the fact that people are still suffering all over the world. And I believe now it's my responsibility to do something about that. I've been gifted this life. I've almost lost it on so many occasions. I actually right. found out 10 years after coming back from the war from my staff sergeant that our vehicle drove over an active bomb. And for some reason, it didn't explode. Wow. But some reason it explodes. So I don't know what the fuck that all means in the grand scheme of things. But what I do know is that I've had many situations where I could have died, not just in war, yeah. from falling boulders in the Himalayas, this, that, and the other right. thing, right? And now I believe I'm here for a reason. So my fear is that I will die never having really guided people through their darkness to help them find some meaning in their suffering. Right. But like you said earlier, your expeditions is no different than war. You're just fighting a different enemy. And you could die on an expedition as opposed to dying in war. I mean, realistically, you could go outside your house and be hit by a bus. Of like course. It, it, it's just the reality of the world. But um, do you feel that, that 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 drive that you have for that you had for being in the military and going into war zones is the exact same drive that you now have to complete these missions, even though the ideology is kind of the same? I'm doing it now from a very different level of consciousness than I was when, like, for example, when I mentioned when I skied across Greenland, I was just doing it to run away from my demons. I'm not right. doing that anymore. I'm not running away from it. And the reason why I pursue nature over, um, let's say, going into conflict zones is nature is indifferent to your, like, there. so I can better prepare for the hostile. Yes, of course, I could die on the North Pole or the South Pole and stuff like that, but I can train enough to navigate the dangers. And right. nature is just pure in its indifference and hostility towards you, right? It just is. Human beings, not so much. <laughs> so if like <laughs> I go, we, we are not pure in our, uh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Have, we make, so, so I guess the point is why I choose nature as my avenue to explore this for one, many reasons. There's many spiritual reasons uh, uh, why I do it as well. I mean, one of the reasons is I want to also like people do the amount of people that are inspired by my story that have lost weight got enough drugs, yeah. got alcohol, you know? So like yeah. when I do these things, I want to document them. I want to share the lessons. Like here's a dude with all kinds of genetic fuck ups who's out there doing this shit, you know? So yeah. if I can do that and like, it's not just in a cliche way, I'm literally the model of not being able to do all these things. The amount of dumb shit I've done to, you know, <laughs> thank God I'm still alive now. But so if I can do it, anybody can. So I want to tell these stories. And of course I have my own spiritual journey while I pursue them as well. Like the, the sense of oneness I feel with myself, with earth, with, all of all that is like the spiritual evolution that happens there is deeply profound and nature is like this playground for spiritual transcendence whereas engaging with human and i don't get me wrong like i still want to engage in like go on the edges of humanity so for example last year i spent 167 miles running across liberia it's post-conflict zone uh yeah. we ran around ran about a marathon a day across the country to help build a school out there i mean dude i was working with former child soldiers out there women who had been raped the country has yeah. gone through extreme poverty distributing water filters school supplies so i i there's something deeply profound about experiencing humanity on those edges as well and i want to dance on that spectrum but flirting on that line with some degree of awareness on the level of risk. Like I don't, I don't rock climb without rope anymore. So even right. in nature, I have a tolerance of risk that I have reduced because right. to me, and this is not a judgment again, I know rock climbers who do it, not a judgment against and to each their own. But to me, that level of risk is just way too high. Oh, so I'll, I'll judge him. him. I'll judge him. I'll judge him for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's very true. It's glad to hear that you're doing that because like you said, you, you do have these, um, in th these ideas that you want to, pull through and, yeah, and yeah. adding a fucking rope does help that <laughs> it, it, it helps me come back alive exactly and at some point i do want to meet somebody that uh, you know getting into a relationship and yeah. getting kids that fucking terrifies me more than all <laughs> other shit man so uh, <laughs> yeah it terrified me more than war i agree with that um so um i do want you to tell everybody how to find you uh because you do do a lot of this on on youtube and, and instagram so tell us where our listeners can find you yeah, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, that's the one I'm mostly on, YouTube, at Fearvana. So F-E-A-R-V-A-N-A. -A -A. You can also find me at Fearvana.com. And the book is available on Amazon, Kindle, Audible, all of it. And like I said, all the profits of the book go to charity as well. And we support like survivors of sex trafficking, the former child soldiers, the people in extreme. Like the, the foundation supports people really in those sort of the darkest corners of the globe and helps them get out of that. So I'm very honored to be a part of that work. And uh, yeah, Fearvana on all those platforms. Thank you for listening to the full episode of Ruck Up Podcast. We wish you all to be very safe out there in your line of duty. And if you have a story to tell and want to be on the show, please check us out on all the social media sites, our website at www.ruckupmedia.com, and check us out on our show notes and any other way you can get a hold of us. Stay safe out there, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Peace out.